Hello and welcome. We have presented a number of talks about Rolls-Royce in aviation. Stories such as Rolls-Royce in aviation, Rolls-Royce from beginning up to Schneider Trophy, Rolls-Royce, Schneider Trophy to present day, Sir Stanley Hooker, not much of an engineer, Avon Sabre fighter jet, Sir Harry Ricardo, pioneering engineer, Sir Frank Whittle, the jet engine. Truly, the Rolls-Royce story is fascinating. I have said that Frank Whittle was the inventor of the jet engine. Comments were posted online stating that Maxime Gulami had already patented the turbojet concept nine years earlier in 1921. However, that engine was never feasible at that time. Whittle's jet engines were developed and patented in 1930, some years earlier than those of Germany's Hans von Hahn, who designed the first to fly but never operational turbojet engine. Our audience is attentive and knowledgeable. It was Whittle's access to the special alloys which gave his engines an advantage over the German engines. It was in January 1940 that Whittle had met Dr. Stanley Hooker of Rolls-Royce, who in turn introduced Whittle to Rolls-Royce board member and manager of their Derby factory, Ernest Hives. Hooker was in charge of the supercharger division of Rolls-Royce Derby and was a specialist in fluid dynamics. Hives agreed to supply key parts to help the project. Rolls-Royce built a compressor test rig which helped Whittle solve the surging problems and thus Rolls-Royce became involved in jet engine manufacturer. The flight. An airplane was rolled out with a shape I had, well not so much the shape but the construction of which I'd never seen before because it had no propeller and an extraordinary whining noise came from it and it taxied out to the end of the runway and after a while eventually took off and I was quite astonished to know what it was because I'd never heard at this stage in my career of a jet aircraft. The various government ministries refused to film this remarkable event. Luckily, an unknown photographer grabbed it in secret. Jerry Sayre was sitting at the end of the runway, and a party of us was sitting just to the right, and he held it on the brakes and ran out the engine to full speed, released his brakes, and then he, he hopped off in about 600 yards. Quite an impressive takeoff. Then he held it down level and then glided. Recently, I came across a talk by Captain David Wensley, US Air Force, at the Western Museum of Flight. In this talk, he talks about the period 1947 to 1991, which we know of as the Cold War. He explains how the British Rolls-Royce Neen jet engine finished up in Russian MiG-15 jet fighters in Korea, being flown against the Americans. Strange, eh? Here is that talk. I'm going to take us back now a little bit and talk about the evolution of the technology. I just want to remind everybody that until late in World War II, there were no jet aircraft. The jet age got its start in World War II. I'm going to walk you through a few points about these aircraft you see on the screen. The only countries that had jet engines at that time were Great Britain and Germany. The United States did not have a jet engine. Russia did not. Japan did not. But Great Britain developed uh, the invention of Frank Whittle, which uh, was a centrifugal flow type of jet engine into an operating aircraft engine that powered uh, the Gloucester Meteor. There were two of those engines, they called them the Goblins at that time. And then they were subsequently built by de Havilland and also then by Rolls-Royce and went through a series of progressions in development to, to become a, a very widely used engine called the Rolls-Royce Nain or Nain aircraft engine. By the way, that's an odd name, N-E-N-E. -N -E. Most people have never heard of it. Uh, what it is is a river in England. Rolls-Royce decided to name all their engines after rivers. 
I don't know why, but they thought there was an, an analogy between the flow of the water through the stream and the flow of the air through the engine. I'm glad we didn't do that, or we might have some things named Mississippi and Monongahela and a few other names we wouldn't like. So I'm glad we just didn't do that. J33 worked pretty well, actually, and J47. On the right-hand side, on the upper uh, photo, is a, is a picture of a ME262, a twin jet engine that Germany introduced late in the war. 100 miles an hour faster than the fastest aircraft we had at the time. A uh, very scary operation to be in a B-17 or a B-24, I would think, and see a stream of those or even one or two coming at you so fast you couldn't train your guns on it. The, uh, the ME-262 was powered by two jet engines of a different type, axial flow, which is a type of engine that are used almost as universally today in the jet aircraft industry. These were made either by BMW or by Junkers, but uh, Junkers won the, basically the, uh, the, the contract to build the production units for the 262 and also for the, the Arado 324 in the lower right, uh, uh, principally because uh, their performance was a little better and their reliability was a little better. They could squeeze anywhere between 10 and 20 hours out of an engine before it had to be completely overhauled. Think about that, 10 or 20. How would you like to be flying a commercial airliner today knowing that the engines were only gonna last 10 hours? A little scary. The middle photo on the right is the famous uh, ME-163, uh, the Comet. I have a very personal relation to that airplane. The uh, instructor I had in jet school for T-33 was a former Luftwaffe pilot he went into the Luftwaffe at age 14, and he finished his career in the Luftwaffe flying the Comet. What he did before that, he would never tell me, but uh, I imagine there were a few uh, uh, American pilots that perhaps lost their lives as a result of work that he did, either in a Focke Wolf 190 or a, a ME 109. But they only selected the best pilots to try to fly that beast. On the lower left-hand corner is, of course, the uh, Lockheed P-80, or F-80, as it was called later. The interesting point here is that uh, when Kelly Johnson designed and built that first airplane in 143 days, we didn't have an engine. So we had to get the engines from Great Britain. They licensed GE to uh, copy their engine, the same one that I mentioned was in the later models of the Gloucester Meteor, and that's the engine that went into the P-80, also into several other aircraft, of course the T-33, as you well know. On the right hand, or the next screen, I'm gonna bring up the MiG-15, Korea, 1950. The U.S. was caught with their pants down once again, uh, not prepared for what they ran into in Korea when the uh, Russian MiGs showed up. Uh, again, here we are with a swept wing jet powered aircraft that we had no match for in the, uh, in the area at that time. We had the P-80s over there, and we had, of course, P-51s. Uh, the Navy had the Panthers, and incidentally, the Panthers, the P-80s, and the MiG-15s all used the same engine. After World War II, uh, the wonderful new Prime Minister of England granted Russia the rights to uh, the uh, Rolls-Royce Nain engine, and he sold them 35 copies to make sure they'd get it right when they copied it. So they did. They reverse engineered it. They improved it a little bit. They expanded the uh, combustion chambers, added a few more th pounds of thrust, and came at us in Korea with a MiG-15 powered by a British engine stolen and converted into a Russian variation, I might say. Not stolen, they were granted the privilege. They were not granted the privilege to uh, copy it and produce it in thousands, which they did. Approximately 10,000 produced by a combination of Russia and China. The Rolls-Royce Nain engine was in use through to the late 1950s. This engine was briefly made under license in Australia for use in the Royal Australian Air Force to Havilland Vampire Fighters. It was also built by Orenda in Canada 
for use in 656 Canadair CT-133 Silver Star aircraft from 1952. Russia was an ally to the British and Americans in World War II, principally because Germany chose to invade Russia. You know the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Winston Churchill had been quoted as saying, if Hitler had invaded hell, I would at least have made a favourable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. Of course, once Germany was defeated, Joseph Stalin saw no common purpose with Western powers. Thank you for watching. Comment to add to the conversation. Like, subscribe and hit the notify bell to support our channel.